The gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And, and my first question is for General Flynn. Uh, we know, uh, General Flynn, Flynn, that the loss of lives and, and property uh, could have been avoided, at least some of it, if the D.C. National Guard had been called out early enough to do its jobs. But until the, the district attains a statehood, and we're close on that, uh, but even the territories uh, can call out their National Guard, but the District of Columbia uh, cannot. And now, look at the convoluted process that's in place. The D.C. National Guard reports to the Secretary of Army, who in turn supports, reports to the Secretary of Defense, who then reports to the Commander-in-Chief. If you understand that chain of command, you'll understand why there was not help earlier on January 6th. General Flynn, it, 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 is what I describe the correct description of the chain of command? Congresswoman, it is, as I understand the authorities, yes. Now, there are multiple layers of bureaucracy and, and, and red tape uh, that had real life consequences on January 16th. And we've we got some of these documents here. I've looked at them. Uh, we've gotten them from the US Capitol Police. And we've gotten them from the DC Police. And we know that city officials here in the District of Columbia pleaded for help. I think the chairman, the chairwoman said 12 times before finally the acting secretary, remember, you got to go to him to get the DC National Guard to begin to do its job. Uh, and just after 4.30, uh, they came, but the mayor of the District of Columbia had called the Secretary of the Army at 1.34. So you've got uh, almost four hours. But we need to thank the men and women of the D.C. Police Department because they had already answered the call for help and they had begun arriving at the Capitol even 30 minutes earlier. The, D the D.C. National Guard didn't get any authority to arrive at the Capitol until four hours after the call for help. And so, Madam Chair, that, that's what has led in, what in part has led to the loss of life and the confusion uh, that resulted from the insurrection. Uh, General uh, Pyatt, uh, I noted in your written testimony uh, that you have provided and I'm going to quote from it. You said, I was definitely concerned about the public perception of using soldiers to secure the election process in any manner that could be viewed as political, end quote. General Pyatt, do you believe that the current DC uh, National Guard change, chain of command to the president through the Secretary of Defense, of course, appointed by the President, to the Secretary of Army, appointed by the President, could inadvertently politicize and complicate the use of the DC Na National Guard. Madam, I believe the complication comes from the lack of unity of command and unity of effort. What we saw after January 6th, when we prepared for the inauguration, was an integrated security plan across the district with one lead federal agency so that one request could be worked out immediately with that agency and they had the authorities to move and maneuver forces to wherever they would be needed. I see my time has expired. 
gentle lady yields back. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white military looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focus on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th th there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. And I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. 
And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day to day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure, it does in certain areas. But is the is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.